Welcome. I don't think there's any reason to start late since we have a completely full house, so we will um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, my name is Theron Dunn, and I want to thank you all for being here on behalf of the Festival Committee. We are so heartened to see so many faces at so many of our events. It's, it's the reason we do it, and we hope you're enjoying yourselves and will continue to come back. Uh, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors who make it possible for this festival to be free and open to the public, uh, our friends and our visitors, uh, both community and from other places. Uh, special thanks to our uh, very generous donors, Nantucket Island Results. Results. <laughs> well, they do have good results, but <laughs> Nantucket, Nantucket Island Resorts, uh, Wendy Schmidt, <laughs> the Nantucket Athenaeum, the Inquirer and Mirror, uh, WCAI, uh, N Magazine, Half Productions, the Nantucket Historical Association, and the Dreamland Theater, uh, all of whom have helped make, really have made this festival possible. Uh, we. The work that we do goes on year round. The festival is, is our showpiece, but we do work with the schools year round here. And uh, that's also possible by donations from our friends and, and neighbors, as well as these um, generous donors. So we have forms if you'd like to make a donation as you go out. And we also have cards so that you can give us your email address if you'd like to be notified um, about what we're doing. We'd like to let you know. Uh, after Carl Safina's presentation, he will be signing books. Um, books will be for sale, so please uh, avail yourself of that opportunity. Uh, please uh, note the emergency exits, silence your telephones, and I now give you Cormac Collier, the Executive Director of the Land Council, a very important part of our community, to introduce Carl. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Saturday's talk with Dr. Carl Safina at the Nantucket Athenaeum. It's always uh, wonderful to be in this gorgeous room. As Theron said, my name is Cormac Collier. I'm the executive director of the Nantucket Land Council. We are a nonprofit land conservation and environmental advocacy group here on the island. And I am very pleased to be introducing our speaker this afternoon. One integral aspect of the work that I do is to discuss the why of conservation. Why do we go to such great efforts to protect the plants, the animals, and the habitats of this planet? Why is it important? Why is it necessary? One way to help answer this question is to cultivate a relationship, an intimacy with, between our audience and the natural world around them. Our speaker tonight is an expert at facilitating that relationship. Dr. Safina's writings not only educate and inform, but inspire the reader to think deeply about whom they are and how they fit into the natural environment. Dr. Safina's writings have won Orion, Lannan, and National Academy's Literary Awards, John Burroughs, James Beards, and George Rabb Medals. He has, a PhD, he has a PhD in ecology from Rutgers University and is the inaugural holder of the Endowed Chair for Nature and Humanity at Stony Brook University. Won't you please help me welcome Dr. Carl Safin. Thank you, everybody. And um, I am uh, I'm so appreciative to see so many of you here. It's really fantastic. So what would you like to talk about today? <laughs> I um, want to tell you just a little bit about me. I, my father had a hobby. Um, his hobby was breeding canaries. And we lived in Brooklyn, New York. We lived in a tenement flat in Brooklyn. And there's not really a lot of wildlife. You wouldn't expect anybody to be in close contact with other kinds of living things there. Um, but unusually for a small child, unusually even for a small child who would live in a much more rural place, I, in my tenement flat, had easy access to watching birds uh, from a few inches away, getting on and off their eggs and feeding their babies, and the apartment was always full of bird song. And I have to think that that made a huge difference in my early life. 
Also, my father had raised pigeons when he was uh, a young man, also in Brooklyn. You know, raising pigeons was a, a popular hobby in urban areas. People had pigeon, they used to call them lofts, pigeon coops on rooftops. So I wanted to be like my father, like a lot of, a lot of boys uh, do, you know. So when I was about five, I started demanding that I must have my own homing pigeons now. And uh, it took a couple of years of nagging, but by the time I was seven, we fixed up a shed that was falling apart in the little backyard of, uh, of those apartment buildings. And I got some homing pigeons, and, um, and they were mine, and I had to take care of them, and I watched them at very close range. And when you, when you have pigeons, what you do inside the coop is you have stacks of boxes of some kind. In, in those days, we just got uh, some apple crates or peach crates from the grocery store, and we simply stacked them up, and we put bowls in each crate and left out a pile of nesting material. And I, at the age of seven, watched the pigeons choose who they were going to live with and make their nests in their little apartments and raise their babies and go out every day. They were homing pigeons after all. They got let out every day and they would fly around. And they would come back Sometimes they would fight, and they would, uh, they would feed their babies, and then they would go to sleep. And it seemed very relatable, you know? Um, right across the yard, we lived in our own stack of boxes <laughs> where people decided who they were gonna live with, and occasionally they fought, and the, the adults left every day, and they came back and took care of their babies and went to sleep. I didn't know in those days, I didn't know anything about what you were allowed to believe about animal behavior or animal minds. It just seemed to me that in broad strokes we were identical. And then I went to college and I, I worked with wild animals in various settings and I went to grad school and I got degrees in ecology and evolution and I learned a lot about behavior and I learned all the rules about what you were not allowed to question about whether they had any feelings or emotions or thoughts or anything like that. So I learned all of that, but um, the idea that we were all basically the same in broad strokes has never left me because I think it's true. Um, if you really think about what our lives are about, we try to stay alive, we, we have to find food and a place to live, and we try to keep our babies alive, and that's pretty much it. So um, that's the feeling I've had about them. But you know, if you were at uh, perhaps Jody Picot's talk earlier today, or um, or Isabel Wilkerson's talk talking about race, race is largely about not understanding who we're here with. That's what the problem really is. And there's even a larger gap, I would say, uh, between what we call humans and animals. Even though humans are animals, we are all animals with the same evolutionary history, but we see this gigantic gap and we refer to all the other living things on this planet as it. Uh, mostly because we don't know anything about them. We know a little bit about some of our pets who live with us, and those become part of our family because we know who they are. But we don't know who else lives with, here, lives with us here on Earth. So that's what I was interested in, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to spend most of the next little while reading some excerpts from my book. I'm trying to get my watch off here. Actually, my wife's watch, um, so I can keep track of my time. And, th and then we'll have a nice long question and answer period. But this is the, the very, very opening of my book, Beyond Words. 
Another big group of dolphins had just surfaced alongside our moving vessel, leaping and splashing and calling mysteriously back and forth in their squealy, whistly way, with many babies swift alongside their mothers, and this time, confined to just the surface of such deep and lovely lives, I was becoming unsatisfied. I wanted to know what they were experiencing and why to us they feel so compelling and so close. This time I allowed myself to ask them the question that was forbidden fruit. Who are you? Science usually steers firmly from questions about the inner lives of animals. Surely they have inner lives of some sort, but like a child who is admonished that what they really want to ask is impolite, a young scientist is taught that the animal mind, if there is such a thing, is unknowable. Permissible questions are it questions. Where it lives, what it eats, what it does when danger threatens, how it breeds, but always forbidden, always forbidden, is the one question that might open the door. Who? Who animals know who they are. They know who their family and friends are. They know their enemies. They make strategic alliances and cope with chronic rivalries. They aspire to higher rank and wait for their chance to challenge the existing order. Their status affects their offspring's prospects. Their life follows the arc of a career. Personal relationships define them. Sound familiar? Of course, because they includes us. But a vivid, familiar life is not the domain of humans alone. Now, I, with, with that impression that I've had from my whole life of working with uh, and studying wild animals, I I ventured out to see some of these animals that I call the who animals explicitly. These are animals that live in structured social groups so that there are leaders and followers, there are young ones who look to the adults for what to learn, and those relationships define them as individuals. Just as in our own life, we are defined as individuals by our relationships to those around us. So we are who animals, and I went to see some other who animals, including elephants and wolves and killer whales or orcas. So I went with, uh, many of you may know the name Cynthia Moss. She's been studying elephants for 40 years in Amboseli in Kenya, one of the first pioneers of studying the behavior of wild animals along with uh, the likes of Jane Goodall. And I was out with, with um, her protege, whose name is Vicky, Vicky Fishlock, and we're watching these elephants. And the elephants there are, you know, they're accustomed to seeing people. And I commented to Vicky that it was really a delight and a great privilege that we were able to just be there for many hours every day, just watching these elephants behave normally. And I, I said, um, it's just great that they're ignoring us. And she said, they're not ignoring us. They have an expectation of politeness and we're fulfilling it. So they're not paying us any mind. They're totally super aware of what we're doing. And I said, super aware, they seem totally oblivious. Elephants don't seem aware of details, she explains, until something familiar changes. One day, a cameraman working with the researchers decided that for a different angle, he'd position himself underneath the research vehicle. The oncoming elephants, who usually just passed the vehicle, immediately noticed, stopped, and stared. Why was a human under the car? A male named Mr. Nick snaked his slithering, sniffing trunk under there to investigate. He was not aggressive and did not try to pull the man out. He was just curious. Another day, when the vehicle appeared with a special door designed for filming, elephants came exploring, actually touching the new door with their trunk. Vicky adds, when I started, they were not wildly happy about me just sitting and watching them for long periods. They expect you to behave a certain way. If you don't, they'll let you know that they notice. Not in a threatening way, you might get a head shake and a look like, what's your problem? 
Through hummocks and bush in our vehicle, we amble along with them. An elephant named Tekla, walking just a few yards ahead to our right, suddenly turns, trumpets, and generally objects to us. To our left, a very young elephant wheels around and screams. It appears to me that we have separated the mother from her baby, but Tekla is not the mother. Another female, whose two breasts are full of milk, runs in, cutting just in front of us. This one is actually the mother, but Tekla was communicating, the humans are getting between you and your baby. Come and do something. Mother rejoins baby, restoring order, and we slowly proceed. When one individual knows another's relationship to a third, as Tekla knows who the baby's mother is, it's called understanding third-party relationships. Primates understand third-party relationships, so do wolves, hyenas, dolphins, birds in the crow families, some parrots. A parrot, say, can act jealous of their keeper's spouse. When the vervet monkeys that are common around camp hear an infant's distress call, they instantly look to the infant's mother. They know exactly who they and everyone else are. They understand exactly who is important to whom. When free-living dolphin mothers want young ones to stop interacting with humans, the mothers sometimes direct a tail slap at the human who has the baby's attention, signaling in effect, end the game, I need my child's attention. When the dawdling youngsters are interacting with dolphin researcher Denise Herzing's research assistants, their mothers occasionally direct these reprimands at Herzing herself, showing that the dolphins understand that Dr. Herzing is the leader of all the humans in the water. For free-living creatures to perceive the rank order in humans, that's pretty amazing. What I find most amazing about it, Vicki sums up, is that we can understand each other. We learn the elephant's invisible boundaries. We can sense when it's time to say, I don't want to push her. Words like irritated, happy, sad, or tense, they really do capture what the elephant is experiencing. We have a shared experience because, she adds with a twinkle, we've all got the same basic brain. I'm gonna go on here just a little bit more with the elephants because, well, I like elephants. <laughs> Here's someone feeling a little silly, Vicky says, pointing. See her with that loose walk and that trunk swaying? I do. One day when I was new here, Vicky recalls, Nora and I were watching and suddenly everyone started running around and trumpeting. I was like, what the hell just happened? And Nora said, oh, they're just being silly. I thought, silly? And the next thing I know, a full-grown female elephant comes along walking on her knees and throwing her head around, acting just daffy. They were just happy, they were like, yay. Everyone says how smart they are, but they can be ridiculous, too. If a young male doesn't have a friend around, sometimes he'll make a little mock charge at us, then back up or twirl around. I actually had one male kneel down right in front of the car and throw zebra bones at me, trying to get me to play with him. <laughs> when someone says you can't attribute human emotions to animals, they forget the key leveling detail. Humans are animals. Simply deciding that other animals can't have any emotions and human, th that humans feel is a cheap way to get a monopoly on all the world's feelings and motivation. We never seem to doubt that an animal acting hungry feels hungry. What reason is there to disbelieve that an elephant who seems happy is happy? We can't really claim scientific objectivity when we recognize hunger and thirst while animals are eating and drinking and exhaustion when they tire, but deny them joy and happiness as they're playing with their children and their families. Yet the science of animal behavior has long operated with that bias, and that's unscientific. In science, the simplest interpretation of evidence 
is often the best. When animals seem joyous in joyful contexts, joy is the simplest interpretation of the elephants, of, <laughs> of the evidence. Their brains are similar to ours. They make the same hormones involved in human emotions, and that's evidence too. If an animal comes to lick you and lie down next to you, you assume it loves you, and that's a pretty reasonable conclusion, considering the enormous range of emotions that we label with the word love. Romantic love, parental love, infantile love, love of community, of country, love of food, of chocolate, love of books, of education, of sports, the arts. The word love is a catch-all phrase for so many different positive emotions, emotions that motivate us to erase a distance, to protect, to care for things, to participate, or to stay. We say we love ice cream, a certain movie, practical boats, impractical shoes, or a summer day. Some people love fighting. If we allow ourselves to be so sloppy with such a seemingly crucial word, then one conclusion is inescapable. Animals love. Elephants and birds don't feel their love for one another the way I feel my love, but the same is true of my friends, my mother, my wife, my stepdaughter, and my next door neighbors. Love isn't one thing, and human love isn't all identical in quality or intensity, but I believe that the word that labels ours also labels theirs. Love, as they say, is many splendored, and love is the right word. Now, I'm going to, um, I'm going to read something here. This is, um, I mean, I hate to be so sexist, really, but this is only for the men. So, the women, you can I, check your email, or you, you don't have to listen to this, okay? <laughs> but guys, you need to you need to listen to this. <laughs> men often feel some pressure to measure up as alpha males, to wolf up, as it were. Alpha male connotes the father who at every moment demonstrates that he's in total control in the home, who away from his den site becomes the snarling, aggressive, belittling boss. This alpha male stereotype is spawned from media misunderstanding of the real thing. Fortunately for dads who have little desire to snarl at loved ones and for those who do, the real male wolf is an exemplary male role model. By observing wolves in free-living packs in Yellowstone National Park, I've seen that the leadership of ranking males is not forced, not domineering, not aggressive to those on his team. Actual wolves are not like that. The main characteristic of an alpha male wolf, says ranger and veteran wolf researcher Rick McIntyre, as we're watching wolves, is a quiet confidence, quiet self-assurance. You lead by example and you have a calming effect. Point is, alpha males are non-aggressive with their family. Think of it this way, Rick offers. Imagine two wolf packs or two human tribes which is more likely to survive and reproduce? The one whose members are more cooperative and more sharing, less violent with one another, or the group whose members are beating each other up and competing with one another? So an alpha male in Rick's 15 years of watching daily as real wolves do their thing, almost never does anything overtly aggressive to the pack's other members who comprise his family, consisting of his mate, his sons and daughters, both biological and adopted, and maybe a brother. One famous wolf in Yellowstone, whose collar number, 21, became his name, was considered a super wolf by the people who closely observed the arc of his life. 
He was fierce in defense of family and apparently never lost a fight with a rival pack. Yet with his, within his own pack, one of his favorite things to do was wrestle with his little pups. And what he really loved to do, says Rick, was to pretend to lose. He just got a huge kick out of it. <laughs> he was this great big male wolf, and he'd let some little wolf jump on him and bite his fur, and he'd just fall on his back with his paws in the air, Rick half mimes, and the triumphant looking little one would be standing over him with his tail wagging. <laughs> one year, one pup was a bit sickly. The other pups were a bit afraid of him and wouldn't play with him. One day, after delivering food for the small pups, the super wolf stood around looking for something. Soon, he started wagging his tail. He'd been looking for the sickly little pup, and he just went over to hang out with him for a little while. For all Rick's stories about the super wolf's victories, that's his favorite. Strength impresses us, but what we remember best is kindness. The similarities between male wolves and male humans are quite striking. Males of very few species provide year-round food and protection for females and young, helping procure food year-round, bring food to babies, helping raise young to full maturity over several years, and defending females and offspring year-round against individuals who threaten their safety. That's a very rare package to find in a male. Human males, and wolf males. That's about it. And the more dependably faithful of the two isn't us. Male wolves more reliably stick with the program, helping raise young and helping females survive with exemplary loyalty and devotion. And so our alpha male stereotype could use a corrective makeover. We can learn a thing or two from real wolves. Less snarl, more quiet confidence, leading by example, faithful devotion in care and defense of families, respect for females, and an easy sharing of roles. Call that wolfing up. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> OK. All right, ladies, may I please have your attention again? Okay. So another thing um, that I found and, and wrote about that I thought was really amazing, some of the, some of the stories about um, killer whales, killer whales, who some people like to call orcas. I don't have anything against the name Orca, but if I was one, I think I'd rather be called Killer Carl <laughs> than Orca Carl. So all the researchers call them killer whales because uh, they do hunt things. And um, Orca means uh, basically demon from the underworld. It's not a very flattering name anyway. So, um, Yeah, so some of the things with, uh, with orcas, and I'll start with a, with a couple of stories about dolphins. I'll just tell you about these rather than read. Um, it's possible for people to train dolphins to understand a command that says, do something we never taught you to do. Make something up, do something new. And they, uh, they have hand gesture commands, so it's, it's sign language. So it can be interpreted as do something new or innovate. Anyway, the dolphins do understand what this means. And the first time that anybody tried this, the, the two dolphins, these were two dolphins in Hawaii. They were named Phoenix and Akia Kamai, which means lover of wisdom. They, um, they got the command, they understood what it was, and they you know, they were trained to understand what it meant, and they, um, they went underwater and circled around 
for a few moments, and then they both came out of the water uh, performing what would be a very complicated trick. Um, it was something like both of them spinning to the right and squirting water out the left side of their mouth, something like that. They had never been taught to do. And the, the, the trainer, who was actually a researcher, these were not dolphins that were used for entertainment. They were trying to learn the, the boundaries and the, and the borders of their mental abilities. They never figured out what the dolphins were doing to communicate that because they didn't seem to be using sound and yet they did seem to be communicating to each other something really very complicated. In the Bahamas, there's a researcher named Denise Herzing. I mentioned her in the earlier passage. And she has been studying the dolphins there for about 35 years. They all know her really well and they recognize the boat and um, she knows them as individuals. She knows the groups, she knows who's related to whom. And she says that when, when they arrive, in the boat, which they usually stay there for a couple of weeks, and then they go away for a couple of weeks. When they arrive, it's usually like a, a happy reunion of friends. Everybody knows everybody, the dolphins come over, they bow ride, they jump around, and it seems all happy. But one day she got there, and the dolphins came in sight, well within sight of the boat, but they stayed about 50 yards away, and they wouldn't come near the boat. And she said to the captain, what is wrong with the dolphins today? This is bizarre. And then somebody came up from below and announced that one of the volunteers had just died during a nap in his bunk. Now, how would the, hu how would the dolphins know that one of the human hearts had stopped? And why would they care about anything like that? And why would they act like it spooked them? Don't look to me to answer that question. <laughs> One of the people studying the, uh, the orcas, the killer whales, told me of a story where there was one who, it very, very, very rarely, a baby gets separated from its family. But this happened, I think, only twice in the last 40 years. And um, he went over to be with the baby. They were going to arrange to get the baby back to its family, which they did. So the happy ending uh, was happy in that case. And while he was hanging out, he noticed that um, the little orca was, was around a, a, a short tree branch, something like this that had been floating in the water and was, was kind of fooling around with it. So um, he, he picked up the tree branch and he tossed it and the little baby went out and got it and brought it to him, and he tossed it again, and then uh, she, it was a female, brought it back, and then he went like this, and she just started rolling in the water. Now, to, to get a dog to do any of those things, you have to train them, especially to roll over, you have to train a dog. You know, it takes patience and a few hot dogs, usually. <laughs> He, he said to me, I just went, wow. I mean, she knew what I had in mind, like her consciousness was just sort of linked to mine. There are no words for that. Another perhaps um, spookier story is that there's a researcher named Alexandra Morton in British Columbia and she, very early, early in her working life, when she was in her early 20s, she was working in uh, Southern California where they had, I, th I think it was actually SeaWorld, where they had captive, uh, captive killer whales that they used for entertainment. They had trainers. She was trying to study their vocalizations. And um, she asked the trainer one day, how do you train these whales to do these unbelievable tricks. She had no idea how you could start training them to do that. So the trainer said, well, I'll tell you what, you know, it's, it's late Friday afternoon right now. On, on Monday morning, when I come in, I'll, I'll show you. We'll do something that they've never been trained to do. We'll get them to uh, go around the tank, around the perimeter of the tank, slapping their dorsal fin on the water. We've, we've never ask them to do that, and I'll show you how I would start doing that. And one of, the, one of the whales in the tank where they were watching these whales was named Corky, and she writes, Corky rose 
and slapped her dorsal fin on the water's surface. She did it several more times, then charged around the tank, exuberantly, exuberantly smacking the water with her dorsal fin. That's whales for you, the trainer said. They can read your mind. We trainers see this kind of stuff all the time. Many, many years later, the same woman, Alexandra Morton, and an assistant were out in the open water of Queen Charlotte Strait in British Columbia in a little inflatable boat when she was enveloped in very, very thick fog. She said she felt like they were in a glass of milk. And she had no compass, so it was a little bit hairy because she wasn't entirely sure of which direction to go. She says, 20 minutes later, they saw, uh, she saw a materializing outline of their, uh, wait a second, hang on a second, I just, uh, uh -huh. okay. So, she's drifting around and suddenly, some of the whales she had been following before the fog closed in came back to the boat. And she, she had written that they had been a little evasive that day. But um, she was sitting there for a while and the whales came back to the boat and they got in front of it and she decided she'll just follow them. So, okay, 20 minutes later she saw a materializing outline of their island's massive cedars and the rocky shoreline and the fog opened up and the whales changed direction and left back to where they had come from. And she said that she felt changed. And she writes, for more than 20 years, I had fought to keep the mythology of the orcas out of my work. When others would regale a group with stories of an orca's sense of humor or appreciation of music, I'd hold my tongue. Yet there are times when I am confronted with profound evidence of something beyond our ability to scientifically quantify. You can call them amazing coincidences if you like. For me, they keep adding up. I can't say that whales are telepathic, she wrote, adding, I can barely say that word, but I have no explanation for that day's events. I have only gratitude and a deep sense of mystery that continues to grow. And I don't have any explanation for these spookier stories that I was telling you about the dolphins and the whales and their inexplicable abilities to seem to understand some pretty detailed things and act in some kind of uh, generous ways. But I can tell you what I think the mysteries mean for us. And I think that what the mysteries mean for us is that there is an awful, awful lot going on in the other minds that share this planet with us. And we who have named ourselves after our own minds almost never think about that or about them or about the consequences of what we are doing. In many ways, all these species are living like poor people or tribal people who against us nowadays have very little power but a huge will to live. And we are not always kind to them, to, to say that in the most understated way that I can muster. So I'll leave you with one other little story, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions. In, um, in an aquarium in South Africa, there was a little baby dolphin, and her name was Dolly, and she was an infant, she was nursing, and uh, one day, uh, one of the aquarium keepers was on a break, and he was looking in the tank through a window, and he was smoking a cigarette. And Dolly came over, and she just was looking at him, and she, after a few minutes, she just went over to her mother, and she started nursing again, then she came back to the window and she released a cloud of milk that enveloped her head like smoke. And somehow this nursing age baby bottlenose dolphin had the idea, I'm going to use milk to imitate whatever this guy is doing out there. And when humans use one kind of material or substance to represent another, we call that art. So 
I'm going to stop right there and, and um, invite you to ask me any questions or anything that you would, uh, you'd like to talk about, because we have a few minutes left. Thank you. I thought I saw this hand first. Okay, yes. When I first wrote the book, did I get pushback from the science community? Well, I wasn't expecting much reaction from the science community, because I just assumed that people who hated it or thought I was a dope um, wouldn't bother to say so or, or take any time to write to me. But what I was amazed at was that uh, a number of people did take the time to write and say that they absolutely loved the, the book. So um, I didn't get, I, I, don't, I don't remember getting any negative pushback at all, but I got some really, really uh, generous, really heartening encouragement from people who really enjoyed it. Uh, yes, you had, you had your hand up. Did you want to ask a question? Right. Well, you know, science, a thing about science is that, that there are things that sci some scientists say that, you know, you can't consider. Telepathy is one of those things that you, you're not allowed to consider, according to most scientists. But science is not supposed to have any rules. Science is supposed to have curiosity. So... I mean, I'm not convinced that animals of any kind have any telepathy like that, but there are a lot of stories that are very intriguing, and who knows, maybe uh, if we manage to last in, in 50 years or 100 or 500 years, we'll understand some of these things differently than we do now. But I think that uh, it's important to keep an open mind and maybe sometimes to force yourself, well, I'm talking to me, to suspend a little disbelief which is what I did in considering some of these stories about the, the orcas and dolphins, or some elephant, there were some elephant stories along the same lines as well. Yes? Have my studies uh, changed the way I interact with animals or how I live? Um, I mean, I think that it certainly encouraged me to try to be kinder. Um, I was trying to be kind all along. And one thing that the book really did for me that was totally outside the box was it, it brought up in really high relief important limitations of the human mind to me. You know, and if you just think about, think about other animals, think about what they don't seem capable of doing mentally. They have limitations. We can see their limitations. We are very, very bad at seeing our limitations. And we tell ourselves a story that we are perfected, perfected godlike beings. Um, but that's not really the case. We do, have, we do have mental limitations and emotional limitations. We are, we're quite imperfect, and um, considering how people are with animals and how, uh, how people have talked about animals and how people treat animals, not to mention how we treat each other in many ways still, um, you know, the limitations of the human mind really, really have stood out with me, for me in a way that they didn't quite before, yeah. Yes. Would I put sharks? Is that what you said? In the category of who animals? Um, not in the same sense 
Uh, well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what may be a little yes and what I would say no. They, they tend not to live in structured societies where there are consistent individuals in groups that all know each other individually and um, have certain roles relative to one another. But there are some sharks that kind of seem like there is some of that going on that um, seem to recognize individuals and things like that. So I would say maybe to a slight degree. Now one thing about everything about life is that all of it is on a sliding scale. There aren't the, you know, if I say, okay, some animals are who animals and I define them like that, that's just so I can talk about an, a concept. It's not reality itself. Reality is all on a sliding scale. And there are some animals that are who animals for part of the year, you know, birds at their nests. They, they uh, know their mates, they're intimately involved with raising their young, the young know who their parents are, but then they leave, it's a temporary thing. Some of them come back the next year and find the same mates, but some of them don't. So everything is on a sliding scale. So I would say um, sharks maybe a little, uh, not so much in that way. As far as their individual relationships to one another defining them. But another part of all of this is that e every animal ever studied has what we can only call personality because we don't have a word for animality, uh, the, the, which, which I define as individuals who respond differently to the same stimulus. And, and every animal ever looked at in this regard shows individual differences in their behavior, all the way down to spiders. So we see with the sharks, for instance, these sharks that they're tracking, some of them hang out in some places, they hang out in other places, they go back to where they were. I mean, they do have individualized lives. They don't have these kind of close, personalized relationships in the way that elephants do, or killer whales, or some of the other, uh, you know, apes, some of the other, other ones like that. Yes. Do we have any pets? Yes, we have two dogs. I don't think I have to tell you that they are the best dogs ever. And we have five chickens um, who we, they're egg laying hens. We have them for eggs. And they, every day they get to just roam around completely unfenced. They can go anywhere they want to go. And they, they have a little area that they like. They basically like our backyard and our front yard. And, and we're kind of surrounded by woods. And they don't like the woods. They like our neighbor's lawn. They, generally, they don't go out in the street. My joke is, why don't our chickens cross the road? And, they, and, um, and we have two little parrots that uh, somebody gave us. And we have Frankie the king snake. So th that's, our, that's our current our current menagerie, yes. And um, our, our hens are really nice. We call them the ladies or the girls. And, um, and we, we have no, no interest in ever eating them. You know, we are, we are a one-stop uh, hen raising, egg producing retirement home for, for <laughs> laying hens. Uh, yes, in the back I saw. Okay, okay. yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a real softball you just pitched to me because that the idea that humans are the only animals that understand death is is one of the many completely ridiculous things that people say when they start a sentence with humans are the only. Um, first of all. There, every predator needs to understand death in a very operative way because they, they, ha, they, they sneak up on things, they understand the element of surprise or when to wait until the potential prey's head is down before they launch their attack, and while the prey is struggling, they hang on and then they understand when it's over. So in this operative way, they professionally understand death because they deal in it. There are um, many animals who um, hang around with dead babies for a while. Cetaceans and apes do this a lot, and then eventually they give them up. 
which if a human did that, you would say they're grieving. Because when our baby dies, we don't just say, oh, it's dead, and walk away. Um, um, elephants very notably hang around uh, when they encounter the bones of elephants, especially the bones of elephants that they knew. In, one, in this research camp I was hanging out with, I wasn't there at the time, but a group of elephants, a family of elephants came into the camp and they have about 30 skulls that they have picked up and brought to the camp because they use the teeth to see how old they are. And um, so they came in and they were, they were sniffing the skulls and uh, one elephant stayed with one skull a really long time while the whole family left. And he was with the skull of his mother. And they, they touched the teeth and they, if they have tusks, which nowadays they don't have tusks anymore, they take the tusks out immediately one way or another. Um, but these are what they feel when they greet. They put their trunks in and around each other's tusks and mouths. We shake hands, they put their trunks in each other's mouths. So um, there is that. Now, do humans understand death? No, we absolutely don't because I guarantee you that very, very few people in this room think that when you're dead, you cease to exist. Almost everybody thinks they have an eternal soul. They, people kill each other over what happens to that eternal soul. Does it get reincarnated and come back as another person? Does it come back as another kind of animal? Do we start at birth from nothing and then live for eternity either in heaven or hell? Or have we always existed? Uh, people believe all these kinds of things because most people actually cannot possibly conceive of death, meaning you're done. You, you didn't exist before you were conceived and when you die you won't exist anymore. Very few people have that concept, but some do, and, and other beliefs about death are all over the map. So I would say that humans are not only not the only ones who understand that we die, but humans don't understand really anything about death because they can't agree on it. <laughs> it was good that you asked that question last because it's nice to talk about death with a laugh at the end, so. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. <laughs>